Morning, brethren. Morning. Hope everybody was able to get some refreshment last night and rest, and we're ready to go this morning. Brother Ricky is going to uh, continue in the theme of every joint that supplieth this morning, and he is going to elaborate on feed my sheep. And if you want to turn with me now, it's going to be in John chapter 21, verses 15 to 17. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Now we know that Jesus is no waster of words. Everything he says has an intention and a point. So he's making his point here with Peter by asking him three times, do you love me? This is a very tender time for Peter. This is the time that Jesus referred to in Luke 21. Remember when Jesus told him that you, Satan has desired to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, and after you have been converted, feed, encourage thy brethren, feed thy brethren. He said, strengthen thy brethren. Actually, he said this, and this is what Jesus is doing now. He's doing this for Peter. <clears throat> so Jesus is both confirming Peter's faith to him, and he is ordaining him to the work that he had determined for Peter to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And if you'll notice here in this passage, there are three persons that are involved in this passage, one being Peter, the other being Jesus, who is the chief shepherd, and then the third are the sheep. Um, at this point, I would like to take a little bit of time to speak about Peter. We all know that this is a very beloved brother. Um, he has encouraged us. He has exhorted us. He has corrected us in our times of need, and he has fed us. And so for those who walk by faith, he is a dearly beloved brethren, brother, and he has suffered a great deal of accusations that are false and untrue. And so I want to take this time to, to tell you a little bit about Peter. It's vitally important for us to see God's people as he sees them and to speak about them as he has spoken about them. We don't have liberty to speak or see them in any other way. We, they're his people first and our brethren. So Peter was a key apostle. He was a key apostle. He was numbered among the three. There, were, there was Peter, James, and John. There were the three of them that were often separated from the others when Jesus had a specific thing he wanted to teach them. We know of Peter that he was willing to lay his life down. This is why he drew the sword in the garden. He was ready to fight for the Lord. He was willing to lay his life down. Sister Maddie and Brother Johnson spoke on being zealous Peter was a zealous man. Now, oftentimes, yeah. this is referred to in a negative sense about Peter, but not so. He was zealous, and in fact, he actually lived out what Jesus said about John the Baptist. He said, The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. This yeah. was Peter. He took it, and yeah. he did not let go. He was yeah. zealous for the kingdom. <clears throat> There are some things that Peter said, and I wanted to share just a couple of these scriptures that he said. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away. 
this is what Peter said. He wrote this down. He said this. And how many times have these words been an encouragement to the brethren? In a time maybe that was dark or in a valley or sometime we can go and we can read what Peter wrote. He was feeding the sheep with these words. <clears throat> he said this, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. The Lord will fulfill what he said he will do. Peter knew that, so he wrote it, and he's feeding the sheep. <clears throat> Feed the flock of God which is among you. He took what Jesus said in this passage, and he lived his life in this manner. He fed the flock of God, and now at the end, he's encouraging people, the brethren, to feed the flock. Feed them. Amen. On the day of Pentecost, who was the one that was the, the first one to preach boldly to the people who killed the Son of Glory? It was Peter, and he did a mighty job in doing that. And not only was he clear and articulate in his speaking, but he actually convinced the men of their sin, and they repented. This was Peter, the apostle. Who was the apostle that was given the vision from heaven that the Gentiles, too, would be let That's in? Right. It was Peter. Yeah. The Lord set him apart. He saw it, and what did he do? He went straight to the house of Cornelius, and it, we have record now Amen. of those of us who are not of the natural branch being, being grafted in again mm -hmm. to the natural branch, branch. Most importantly about Peter is he was called of God and ordained to be an apostle to Israel. If that's all we knew about Peter, we would know this was a man that God approved of, that he, he cast his seal approval on this man, and, he, and we want to listen to what this man has to say. Amen. Peter would be a key source by which the body of Christ would be supplied and fed. He has continued to supply the body with the living words concerning Christ. So Jesus asked him, Lovest thou me? <clears throat> Have you heard Jesus ask you this question? Have you? Sister Sydney, lovest thou me? Have you heard that? Or Sister Sarah, have you heard Jesus say, lovest thou me more than these? We all of God's people hear this because it is a legitimate question to be answered. There can be no competing interest when it comes to loving Christ. In fact, this is the first and great commandment. Jesus said un <clears throat> to the one that was asking him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. Everything we have is to be poured into the love of Christ. Amen. Whatever we have is to be given unto him. Amen. And we can do this because he first loved us. <clears throat> Christ loved the church, and he gave himself for her. And this was not a casual giving. Jesus poured out, he emptied himself of everything in order to obtain her. So we too, we see this. The love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then all were dead. So we knew we were dead. The love of Christ showed us this, and it constrains us now to press on to love him. Amen. Amen. Christ demonstrated his love. He lived it out in the earth so that his people would have a handle on what it means to love. <clears throat> when we see the so great a love that Christ loved us, with which Christ loved us, and gave himself for us, we are compelled to love him more. How can we not love him? We owe him our very lives. <clears throat> Amen. Peter had experienced afresh this love that Jesus had for his people. First for the father and then for the sheep. This is Jesus' love. He loves the father first and then he loves his sheep. Peter knew this. He was a recipient of this love. So Jesus asked this question that he asked is only reasonable. Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? <clears throat> and Peter responded, yes, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. So then Jesus' response then is, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, Feed my sheep. These lambs and these sheep belong to the Lord Jesus. They are his. He bought them. He purchased them with his own life blood. They are his. And he cares for them more than anything else. He cares for them above anybody else. Jesus gave himself, the, gave himself to the very least. 
and to the very greatest. Therefore, it stands to reason that he will pr provide food for all of those sheep. And if his sheep are not fed, no one will be fed. <clears throat> if a shepherd does not have an uncompromised love for Jesus, he will not have a natural care for his sheep. He is nothing more than a hireling. And Jesus spoke about this in John 10. He said, but he that is a hireling and not the shepherd who's own, who owns the sheep, he seeth, when he seeth a wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, this is what the hireling does. He leaves yeah. and he flees when there's danger. And the wolf catches them and scatters the, scatters the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. This is what happens whenever the, the hireling does not have a love for Christ. He does not have a natural care for the sheep. Yeah. Amen. Something interesting about sheep, they've been noted as being dumb creatures, but they are not. They are not dumb creatures. They are dependent creatures. They depend on their shepherd and they depend on one another. Sheep have a very gentle disposition. They are not wild and, and unruly, but they're very gentle. They know their shepherd's voice, and they're even finding that they know the face of their shepherd. That doesn't sound like a dumb animal to me. They are easily led. They also have been known, they, they are known for having a keen sense for proper food. Sheep won't just eat anything. They seek out what they know will nourish them. And I read this little article that there are there have actually been sheep that knew that there was food better for them on the other side of a cattle guard. So instead of walking across the cattle guard and getting caught in it, they laid down and rolled over the cattle guard in order to get to the food that was better for them. They exerted themselves because they knew that there was something better for them. <clears throat> their, a protect, their protection is one another. They don't have a natural defensive protection, an aggressive, you know, like we would think of like a lion. You know, he has, he has an aggressive stance and, and he's a predator. Sheep are not that way. Their protection is one another. They have a keen sense of hearing, of seeing, and of smelling so that they can detect their predator. And if they detect a predator, they flee. They run away. <clears throat> There's also key sheep among the flock that are leaders, that can lead them to pasture, that can lead them out of danger. So do any of these traits sound familiar, brother? <laughs> like the Lord, he made the sheep so that we could see how his sheep are. <clears throat> There's a very close resemblance to the natural sheep and the sheep of Christ. <clears throat> this is the flock that Peter was called to shepherd. He was called to feed this flock of God. Amen. So Christ confirmed his love to Peter. He called him to work, to labor in his vineyard, and Peter fulfilled what the Lord had called him to do. So Brother Ricky is going to come up now, and he's going to expound on this, brethren, and I hope this has stirred up your minds and gotten them prepared to, to have a, a very good discussion this morning. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then Brother Ricky will come forward. I'm really grateful for the things that Sister Tasha said about Peter. I have uh, I've thought a lot about Peter. I'm, uh, I'm afraid, unfortunately, I have been subject, and I'm sure you probably have too, to too low of a thinking about these godly people. Uh, this hasn't been something that we've wanted. I've always been uncomfortable with people being critical of godly people. I've never, I've never myself joined into that kind of thing. I, you kind of sense something's not right about this. Especially when they criticize people in areas where God didn't criticize. And by the way, the Spirit didn't say anything about that period of sifting. Only what Jesus said about it. And as soon as he goes out and weeps bitterly... The next thing you hear about Peter is he's with the disciples. Amen. I'll tell you, that's, that's like love covering over a multitude of sins. I'm, th I'm thankful for that. Um, I think uh, I really don't want to say a lot about Peter. I, but let me, just, let me just say these few things. I know there has been among the brethren a labor to bring back <laughs> 
the honor that these people gave to God when they, when they lived holy and godly lives. Uh, we're, not, we're not ignorant of the fact that, that people have sin. We're not saying that, but they were, they, they've been misrepresented, and there's been an, an, an exerted effort among us to show their holiness and their righteousness and how truly godly they were, to kind of redeem their names for the great things that they've done before God. I think part of that is the fact that as our faith increases, the scripture says that we are come to Mount Zion there in Hebrews chapter 12. And one of the things that he says that we have come to is the church of the firstborn. We come to that, this general assembly of godly people. And then he mentions the spirits of just men made perfect, people that have gone on, gone on home. I think that as our faith increases, and as was said yesterday, that faith is the substance of things hoped for, that in fact we are coming into a greater sense of fellowship with these godly people. It's not just that we have an increased academic understanding of them. There is a sense in which we have a very real familiarity and affinity with these godly people. And I really think that when we get to glory, there will be a less need of an orientation than we think. You know what I mean by that? I, I know when, when Peter saw Elijah, he didn't say, who is that? Because there was a, an affinity and a fellowship. And I think when it comes out of us, when, when you hear people being critical of these people, and you, you kind of almost sense something, a rage kind of forming in you. I think what that is, is, is that's an evidence of our familiarity with them. You know, if I see people talking bad about people and I don't know them, there, there might be a general sense of affinity toward humanity that would move me to maybe make a defense. But now if someone spoke bad about Sister Tasha or Sister June or Brother Given or other brother, now, now that, that hot fire burns much quicker because I have a personal affinity with these, with yeah. these brothers. Amen. And so, anyway, I think it's right that we have that. Since uh, Sister Tasha gave such an excellent background on Peter, I will just say a few things. And let me just throw these things in just, just so we understand Peter. Peter's the only man that walked on water. Yeah. Amen. And since you didn't, you shouldn't be critical of someone who did. Peter was also the one who was, who was given that marvelous and good confession. Yeah. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living Amen. God. Do you remember what Jesus said? Thou art blessed. Flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father. Amen. Now, I ought to tell you something. This is what the Father thinks of Peter. He revealed his son to him. And then he said, Thou art Peter, which is, means rock. Amen. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And I know there's a lot of questions. Well, what does that mean? Well, does it mean he's talking about the Son of God as the rock? Yes. Does it mean he's talking about this good confession by which we are identified with Christ? Yes. Is he talking about Peter? Yes. Yes, he is. Peter is that rock, and Peter would go on to be a stabilizing influence in the church as he fed the sheep. And you see that, Sister Tasha mentioned right away there at Pentecost. He, just, he came out, he knew exactly what to say. And all those, all those people were converted to Christ. So, so that, this, is a, this is a truly godly man, okay? Now, I think the, uh, these, these things that I'm going to say right now are germane to us. I think the brethren have been experiencing some, some um, trials probably that are much greater than things they have experienced before. I'm, I'm glad we don't come together and, like, broadcast all this. I would, we'd go out of here with our heads hanging way down. I, I'm glad we don't broadcast it, but I know, I know that you face some things. And so I think there are some things that we can learn from Peter, and we're going to learn them not only by his experience, but by what he says. This sifting that Peter went through was divinely orchestrated. Yeah. I'm afraid I had kind of a notion for a long time that things just kind of got out of control. Before I understood the sovereignty of God, I just kind of thought things kind of got out of control, and Satan just got a hold of Peter, and now look at this mess. Well, that really wasn't what happened. God sent Satan to do that Amen. because Peter was going to be the better for having been sifted. Hmm? I'm afraid I don't like it when people say that here's the critical hour where Peter failed. Well, I really don't like that view of this. That isn't really what this was about. 
This wasn't a time, really, for Peter to stand up for Christ. Jesus already told them, the shepherd will be smitten and the sheep will scatter. This was a time to scatter. Now, later on, these disciples, they'd give their lives for Jesus. See? I, I'm not condoning. I'm not condoning what happened, so don't get me wrong here. But I'm seeing more of what God has done here. And here's something Peter had to say. He talked about trials. He said, this great salvation that we've come into, said, we greatly rejoice in this, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold, that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Christ. So what Peter means is, if you're walking by faith, you come out of the trial and you're stronger. See? You're stronger. You're more focused. And now you have a testimony from Christ. You have more experience. Your hope abounds after coming out of trial. Another thing that happens is your love for Christ abounds when you come out of trial. See, when you're going through a heavy trial like this, and I'm not saying I've been through like the degree to which Peter been through. I, I've been through a smaller measure, a lot smaller measure of something like this as of recent. But uh, well, when you're in trial, there's two things that come out. One is the smallness of who you are, and the other is the greatness of who your Savior is. Yeah. I don't mean the smallness of who you are in Christ. I mean the smallness of who you are by nature. Who you are by nature. It's like flesh falls apart in difficulty in trial, see? Peter had kind of a similar experience that Jonah had when he said, Thou hast cast me into the deep. In the midst of the seas and the floods compass me about all thy billows and thy waves. Do, do you have that view when you're in trouble? Do you realize it's coming from, the, from God? Have passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy temple. See, and so, so Peter was the one who knew better than anything else. The reason why he survived that sifting is because Jesus is a great Savior. And he told Peter, I have prayed for thee, so that when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. See? Now, let me tell you the reason why I'm saying that. One thing is because great labors are always preceded by great trials and testings. If you look at Joseph's life, that's how it was. He got this great revelation of how he was going to be greater than his brothers and even greater than his father. And, and then you think, well, now it's smooth sailing from here. No, he goes into affliction, sold into Egypt, false accusations against him, went down into prison. They hurt his feet. It was, these difficulties made it look like, well, he wasn't slated for the throne at all. But this is how God works. This is how God works. And the Son of God himself is the greatest example who learned obedience by the things which he suffered. So, brethren, if we, if we are passing through tribulation and you're doing it by faith, yeah. now, if you're committing sin and God wails on you, now, that's not what I'm talking about. But if you're walking by the faith of Christ Jesus and affliction comes your way, I think we have to think about it this way. It's a call from God to come up higher. Amen. Come up higher. Brother, let's come up higher. You're going to be sifted, but when you come out of this trouble, you're going to be able to do what God has called you to do. Amen. See, Brother Tony? This is good, Brother Ricky, because when you consider that God is bringing many sons to glory and, and that he's preparing, he's actually preparing the people of God, then you can see now, you can go and see how that Peter is now being prepared mm -hmm. for, for these, in a few weeks. Now, he's, he's getting ready to do some things that God knows about. He's going to get... Peter sensitive, he's going to get Peter, this actually, this was a circumstance that God created. That's right. And, and he uh, prepared uh, Peter to do it. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 See, God's people, we're not robots, and you can't serve God like robots or like machines. We're not like machines. I'll tell you, I, you know, I can go out to my car, and, you know, I turn the key, and it starts, and I pull it and drive, and it goes out every time. But, but People try and serve God this way. They try and serve God by more routines and procedures and these kind of things. And we've all found this, this doesn't work. Because true service to God has to come from the heart. Amen. That's what, uh, whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord. There has to be a deep, 
driving and dominating compulsion within that moves you to the service of God. It has to be, see? And that's part of what this sifting was about. If Peter comes out of this with a greater measure of love toward Christ because of what Christ did for Peter, this makes Peter a better feeder of the sheep. Everything you do for God has to be done primarily with a love toward God and toward his son. Nothing is more damaging to the ministry of a person than when their love for Christ is skewed and some personal interest enters in or some corrupted thing that turns their attention away from Christ, maybe, maybe preaching for the paycheck, see? Or maybe like John had to deal with of one of the brothers that wanted to have the preeminence among the brethren. That's what he wanted, so he wouldn't receive John. And these kind of things. There are people, like Sister Tasha said, who are simply hirelings. They don't serve Christ out of a love for Christ. And whatever you do for Christ, it has to be done primarily with a dominating love for the Son of God. And when that happens, then you'll, you'll be like, you'll be like T Timothy was, who had a natural care for the sheep. Why did he? Because he knew they were his sheep. See, they were his sheep. Sister Melissa. We see this in the world, I mean, just with people in their natural professions of work that they do. If they really love their job, they love what they're doing, then they have a care for the things that they're doing. But if they don't, then they don't care for the company, they don't care for the people. Mm -hmm. So why wouldn't it be the same whenever you're uh, feeding the sheep? If you, if you care for Christ, then you're going to care for his people. That's right. Amen. 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 That has meant to me, that has meant a lot to me as of late, to be able to particularly and firstly associate the people of God with God. Not first with one another, but first with God, to see that they are his sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. He didn't say, Peter, do you love me? Feed the sheep. He said, do you love me? Feed my sheep. See, that's the kind of word that will draw upon the heart of a person who truly does love the Savior. They are my sheep. Think of it this way. These are the ones for whom I died. Remember he said that to the, he said that to the elders? He said, feed them because they have been bought by blood. Yeah. And so he encouraged them to feed them. So you make the association between the people and Christ first. And then, of course, your love for Christ will compel you. Yes, I want to give every advantage to these people as I possibly can because they belong to the Savior that I love. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. That's, that's, that's a good thing to behold. As Brother Gibbon said yesterday, you're more of this compulsion, a desire. This isn't a we should, we ought, we have to. It's not that kind of thing. It's this is what we want to do. We are compelled to do this. We love to do this. This is what we prefer to do is to do this very thing. Yes? Yeah, this, this comment about, um, you were sharing about people pointing out the, the flaws and the faults of, of Peter and, and others. And this, this is a, it's very popular to, for preachers today to psychoanalyze people in the Bible uh -huh. and show us all their flaws. And, and I think they do that to identify with them. Because I, I think there's some people that feel like the people in the Bible aren't real people. And so we have to quote unquote make them real. I've actually I've actually was taught to do this in school. You got to make it make them real, as if they're not real. Uh, and so people want to people want to identify with the saints, and even saying saints. See, a lot of people when you say saints, they automatically say, "Well, that's not me," yeah. you know. Yeah. But we have to understand, as you already said. These people are in Scripture for their faith, not for their flaws. Now, we sh everybody should know that flaws are a given for human beings, right? This is, this is, this is, everybody has flaws. It's, that's a given. But the saints are in the Scriptures not to display flaws, but to display faith, which we're to copy, and we're to identify with that, Amen. not with their flaws, but with their faith. Amen. And... It should be obvious that God works with people with flaws because there aren't any other kind of people. That, that really doesn't even need to be said. Mm -hmm. I suspect that the agenda behind this modern propensity to 
point out the flaws of people in the Bible is to justify remaining flawed yourself. That's exactly right. Okay. Yes. So, yes. instead of saying, I want to mimic their faith, some people will say, well, the people in the Bible are flawed. That means it must be, and they were blessed by God. It must be okay if I just kind of remain flawed. <coughs> And I'll get, I'll get blessed. Mm -hmm. And so they justify their flaws rather than allowing the faith of the saints to call them up higher. Yeah, that's right. mm -hmm. So we, we, the point of the scripture is we can share in the faith of the saints like Peter. And we should share in their faith because there is only one faith. That's right. Amen. So that should, be, that should be our goal is to imitate their faith. Amen. And not just focus on their flaws but to rise, but to rise above even, though, even our own flaws that we have. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. 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 One of the brethren addressed this a little bit whenever he said that if, whenever we see something that is very prominent in the brethren, that is a quality of Christ, that that's there to provoke us in that area. Yeah, yeah. All right, so we have a lot of examples of faith in the brethren to, so that there really isn't a part of us that is not challenged to cast off the unfruitful works of darkness and to press in by faith and apprehend what is available in Christ to be more perfectly conformed. Perfectly meaning holy as well as completely formed to the image of God's dear Son, which is the lot of the saints. That's what we're yep. being called to. And then what you're talking about there with the, uh, the shepherds, Sister Tosh had a very good remark when she said if, if the, 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 sheep are, the sheep are not fed, no one gets fed. Mm -hmm. Well, you have to, a shepherd is first a sheep. That's right. And then, yeah, but he can only give yeah. what he has been given, what he has received mm -hmm. himself. And if, if this is someone who is, who is unlawfully preaching Christ, in other words, they don't know him. They've been taught the form of things and they don't have the substance of it themselves then they're they're really not going to be a, a really good under shepherd they're not, they can they can give out some information and happily the Lord by the spirit will bless somebody with the information because it was his revelation that's been repeated but it's just being repeated in their mouth right, yeah. it's not really being ministered by, by them and to, to say that people are like we should do this we should do that whatever. <coughs> whenever you're a sheep this is what you're taught of the Lord to do and these trials that, that the brethren in the, and even whenever it said things that we would call a flaw because of perhaps the revelation wasn't complete to them. Uh, again, we to see the saints as God sees them, to see them do what they do with what they've been given right. is a blessing. But uh, that they are being made a partaker of this. They're, in, in other words, God is demonstrating their worthiness to be heard. What Peter and some of the other brethren went through Whenever they stood up and said, I know Jesus is the Son of God. You knew that this wasn't just something they thought was a really good thing to say. Their lives had already demonstrated their absolute devotion and, con and conviction of the truth of that. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. Yeah. What Brother Jason said is absolutely true of it. The critics of these people are trying to bring them down to their level mm -hmm. so they can excuse their own their own state. But even even if you can see that Peter had flaws, which that's not how he's represented, but let's say he did he was light years ahead of anybody else in our age. Mm -hmm. He's the one God revealed who Jesus was. Amen. Yeah. He did it. He died for Jesus. He spent three solid, uninterrupted years with Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, I don't think there's a man on earth that can make this kind of a claim. Right. See, so there, there's a <coughs> fundamental dishonesty in these people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They refuse to, give it, refuse to give any kind of honorable credit to them. Mm 
They're dishonest people, they're imperceptible people, and they're people trying to justify themselves. Yeah. Let them make a comparison of themselves with Peter. <coughs> Let them do it. And they won't even come, they won't come close to Peter. Well, the fact that their conclusions, uh, look at their conclusions, instead of being provoked by their faith and being, and being drawn to the message, they're busy trying to make them look bad. Yeah. Yeah, and, this, and this makes Jesus look bad because Jesus then made yeah. a blundering fool and made him. apostles of the Jews. Yeah, he chose yeah. Absolutely. So it's, it's, not a, it's not an innocent gesture. Yeah, These people do not have integrity. Mm -hmm. They're fundamentally dishonest. Brother, as a follow-up to that, too, um, it's odd. Paul, Paul said, you know, the famous quote in 2 Corinthians 12, God's power is made perfect in weakness. This is routinely, weakness there in that context is routinely interpreted as like faults, flaws, yes. sins, yes. making mistakes. That is not what Paul was referring to. Right. Right. If, you, if you read that context in, in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, or sorry, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 10, 11, and 12, the weaknesses he's talking about are sufferings from Christ. He's not, he's not saying, God's grace and power is made perfect when I'm a stupid idiot. That's not what he's saying. He's not, that isn't true at all. God doesn't bless our foolishness and, 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 give us more, and give us more power when we make stupid decisions and when we're worldly. I mean, the very thought is just kind of laughable. Right. When you think about it, but but in the church world, that that I this is very popular today yeah. to say, you know, it's it's okay to be weak and foolish and sinful and worldly because that's the kind of people God uses. Well, that's not at all what the Bible says. Amen. The Bible told, the Scripture tells us to be sanctified, to be set apart, to be holy, to not love the Amen. world, to be holy vessels for the right. Lord. Amen. And so there, there's a, I think Brother Given is right. There's a, there's a, these people, they have an agenda. It's a dishonest agenda. Yeah. It's, not, it's not a biblical way of viewing the kind of people God uses. If, if this logic was true, Judas should have been the chief apostle, not Peter. That's right. That's right. But Judas went out and hung himself. That's right. That's right. Amen. And, and Peter repented. That's right. Brother Jeremy? Uh, there is an agenda behind this. The, those who are preaching false things and twisting things and trying to make it fit or whatever they want to come up with. When they're doing this, it's wrong. Mm -hmm. but it's also wrong for people to sit there and, and soak it up as if they're not enjoying this also. Because we mm -hmm. do have the scriptures on these. Now, I'll give you an example. If you just sit there and listen to everything you hear about Moses, you would almost think he was just a bumbling idiot that was scared. But the scripture, this is how the Holy Spirit talks about Moses. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him at who is invisible. Mm -hmm. That's how the Holy Spirit talks about him. Yeah. So for you to think anything other than about Moses, about what they've tried to mold him into, well, why? How come you didn't read this for yourself? Yeah. How come you didn't seek out the truth for yourself? I mean, so what I'm saying is, there, there, there isn't anything innocent about not knowing. Mm -hmm. God's going out. He's going out of His way to give you a picture of what how He sees right. His people, how He sees, and for anybody to, to have a different view and to say and to try to come up with an idea of well, this, this is why it's okay that I'm not like godly. Well, we have plenty of to know what God thinks about this for you not to be innocent. Right. If you read the, the general record of Moses, you would get the idea that Moses was faithful. Yeah. Amen. It's the it's 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 time. We're talking when we talk about Peter, we're talking about a particular time of trial. A time of, and by the way, Peter came out of that trial with faith intact. Amen. So that night, absolutely, brother Jonathan and then sister Tasha. You happen to come across a fault in one of these brothers and reading about them, you'll find that it's often quite minimal in the metal. There's really not a lot recorded against these people, but there is a lot said about the good things that they do. 
the fact that there's so little said about any faults, like I said, if there are any recorded, that just shows that's not how God wants them known. Amen. And it shows to teach you that's not something you want to focus on either. That kind of a life. Rather, on the faithfulness they had, their their holiness, their righteousness, that's the focus. That's the thing you want to follow after. Because there's more said about that than the other. Yeah. Yeah, with all of these brethren, faith is the focus. This, this is the foundation on which anything else can be built on. It's their faith in the Lord. Uh, with Abraham, righteousness was imputed to him, not because of what he did, but because of his faith. He believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. This is what Jesus is going to be looking for when he returns. He's going to be looking for faith. Right. Faith compels you to do these things. It compels you to feed the sheep. It compels you to love the Lord more. All of these things... It, the faith is like an umbrella, and all of these things come underneath it. And so we know that without faith, it is impossible to please God. So if you if you are struggling in some area, if you're if you're not able to overcome in some area, it's not because God is unable to help you. It's because your faith is weak and That's it's right. small. That's right. Go ahead, brother Gibson, and then I'll give you. When. When Satan sifted Peter, Peter wasn't an easy pushover. <laughs> Satan had to work, work, work Amen. to yeah. get Peter to do that. Amen. That's, That's where right. he had desire to sift. He could see he couldn't he couldn't make Peter stumble around with ordinary stuff. Oh, yeah. So he asked for special That's really right. to. Amen. And then one other thing about Peter, he Peter was the first one that was it was revealed that Jesus was the Son of God to among the apostles. Amen. John the Baptist. He was revealed to John the Baptist, of among the apostles. He's the first one to preach the gospel of the Jews and the first one to preach the gospel of the Gentiles. So it seemed to denigrate Peter, you've denigrated God. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That's right. We know we don't want to judge someone or make, make a judgment on someone until the trial is over. Mm -hmm. That's so right. The, the flesh will make a judgment on somebody while they're in the middle of the trial. So we learn not to do that, that it's not over. It wasn't over. Right. At that time, That's right. Amen. Well, there, he was in the middle. He was in the middle of trial. Let's see what how this works out. Yes, it works out very well. Amen. 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 And so that, uh, but then if you don't understand that, then see, you, you you do these kind of uh -huh. things. So then what we got, we got a we got a lot of misunderstanding about how the purpose of God and how He works. And uh, mm -hmm. anyway, they don't understand the big trial. That's, our big trial of salvation is not over till, till God comes, till the Lord comes, yeah. and, and He, and he uh, destroys everything and, and, and rescues us. But I wanted to, uh, real quick, I to bring out this thing before we get too far away from it. Sister Tasha said that she brought the fact that sheep, sheep, the animal sheep, they're uh, dependent. Yeah. They're, they're big, they've been made to be dependent. They're needful creatures, she said. And it, immediately I thought, I never thought about this before, but I thought about that time when Martha and Mary and, 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 uh, was uh, preparing supper. And Jesus told uh, Martha, he said, uh, many things, you worry about many things, but one thing is needful. Yeah. Okay, and and uh, Mary has chosen that 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 thing. That's there. And then Jesus tells Peter that feed my sheep. So we learn really what is that. And then of course we saw what Mark, uh, Mary was doing. She was at the feet of Jesus, being fed. But then we learn from uh, we learn from Jesus that that's that's the needful thing is feed my sheep. Yeah. Now we are dependent. We are dependent people. We're dependent on, on that, that mm -hmm. nourishment. That That's, right. That's right. That's right. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Now, the brethren, we're talking here about the purported flaws of the brethren. Uh, the scripture came to mind that love rejoiceth not in iniquity. Yeah. We're not, no, no more than the Lord. Anywhere there is genuine iniquity. We have no no countenance for it. And, but the, the saints, the things that are recorded against them are not like gross iniquities. Right. They're, they're places of their understanding not being perfect and, uh, or that they repent it like this. Brother Tony's talking about the trial wasn't over. They come out of it justifying God, saying, you know, that the Lord is righteous. God will never do anything uh, that is unrighteous or do 
anything unrighteously, which would make it unrighteous. Amen. You know, Amen. So we, and when we, we talk about the things that are done and um, perhaps false shepherds and things like this, there's no, there's no part of us that has any rejoicing in this at all. Amen. It's really a lament and vexation to, to see it because we would, that God would be justified yeah. and Christ is the great Savior. Amen. And where Christ is genuinely working because there is faith mm -hmm. and the truth is being proclaimed, there is evidence Amen. of his working. Amen. 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 One more thing now. We can see that any, any sins committed by Moses or Peter or any of those were forgiven. Amen. 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 Now, how right is it to bring them up? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Or do you want God to do that for you? That's yeah. right. Exactly. Amen. That's right. So we're honoring, we're honoring God's choice of the people. We're honoring God's cleansing of the people. That's right. Those sins that people have they don't exist. Amen. They've been washed away. Amen. 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 Let's make a let's make a leap here. I want I want us to go to feed my sheep because that's going to be more germane to to our our theme. Um, although I did spend a lot of time on Peter, I'm telling you, it was hard to get away from that. This beloved brother, such a godly man. Um, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Now that's what we're going to focus on now. Feed my sheep. Okay. Now. This right here is, in fact, and I've heard this a number of times through the brethren this weekend, is the preferential treatment that is given to the people of God. This is, in fact, a commission both to discover the sheep and then to feed the sheep. It's both those things. Because if you are going, to, if, if it is true that this is like an isolated people, you know, he does, here he doesn't say preach the gospel to every creature. He does say that. He does say that, Mark 16, and that's true. And, this, and these two don't militate against each other at all. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to connect these two things together. But here, it's a more specific commission. It's feed my sheep. Okay? Now, if you're going to do that, you're going to have to be able to discover who the sheep are. Now, how, how are you going to feed them unless you know who they are? I mean, they don't all walk around with name tags saying, Christ's sheep. You're going to have to have a level of discernment. We talked about that. Brother Aaron talked about that. To know who the sheep are from those who aren't the sheep yes, so right. that you can give your attention to the sheep. Yes, right. Okay. Now, this, this truth of preferred treatment for the people of God is something that cannot be denied. It is an astounding thing, brother. And this was my own experience. Okay. So I'm not getting up on a soapbox and talking about things. That I'm, just, I'm just going to beat this horse about something that may not necessarily be true, but I'm so agitated about it is the, the notion that when the people, when the, the sheep are discovered or said another way, they are converted to Christ, then they're abandoned. They're abandoned. They get, you get them into the church, and all of a sudden, now once we can mark them as a number on the denominational roll, then we leave them. We don't give careful attention to feed them so that they can go on to perfection. But see, when you look in the scriptures, you find just the opposite. Okay? Now, this, Jesus is the one that gave this commission, right? That's right yeah. Jesus is the one that said, feed my sheep. So we're getting the red print here. This is from the head, okay? Yeah. This, is, this is Jesus himself saying this. This isn't somebody else saying it. It's Jesus saying this. Feed my sheep. Now, Jesus leads out in giving preferential treatment to his people. Now look at just the night of Jesus' betrayal. Now I don't think there could be a time where Jesus wasn't focused, but there was like a particular focus taking place here, okay? Upon the work that Jesus had now come to the earth to do. Jesus didn't primarily come to the world to work miracles. He primarily came into the world to lay his life down for the sheep. That's what he said. And here in this focused period of time, particularly in the book of John, between the chapters of 13 to 17, you see the preference for the sheep everywhere. Yeah. Amen. Okay? Now think about this. Here's his frame of mind at this time. In John 13, 1, this marvelous summary of the Spirit is given. 
Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them, who is that? His own, unto the end. So what does that mean? That is a parenthetical statement of what Jesus was about to demonstrate from John 13 through John 17. He's loving them to the end. That's what what is happening here is that very thing. And so as he brings his disciples to partake of this Passover time, he says, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Jesus had had his Jesus had had his time in the world preaching to the multitudes but here in this most critical hour when Jesus is about to lay down his life for the sheep and endure this wrath of the living God and to have all the sin of the world laid on him who does Jesus choose to be with Amen. his sheep Amen. that's who he chooses to be with okay now one of the preeminent evidences of Christ's love for a person is that he teaches them. That's right. I mean, if a person's not increasing in understanding, I don't want to be hypercritical, but this could be very serious. Because Jesus doesn't teach people he doesn't love. Okay? He is master. So it's another word for teacher. This is preeminently how Jesus was known when he was in the world. Is like this. He is master, Lord. And so he's known for this teaching. And what do you get from John 13 through John 16? A concentrated level of teaching about critical matters that the disciples needed to know so that they wouldn't stumble during this time. Okay, Amen. He mentions things like the coming of the Holy Spirit, the comforter shall come to be with you forever. He tells his disciples of his own death. Yeah. And then he tells them that he'll not leave them comfortless. He talks about the, uh, the agitation that's going to come from the world toward them. Okay, yeah. He said, the, the world hated me, and it's going to hate you too. Mm-hmm. See, he tells them these things. He tells them a number of things. <laughs> This concentrated teaching. But the thing that I want you to see here is that he spoke plainly to them. Amen. You remember when they're in the midst of this teaching, the disciples say, now he speaketh to us plainly and not in parables. Yeah. Amen. Now, I know people have said that when Jesus, I, we've talked about this a lot, so I'll just say it move on. You know, I don't, that when he taught in parables, it was to help the people understand. Or when Jesus, te- when Jesus teaches in likenesses, it's so that the people will understand. No, likenesses are not revelatory in nature. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> likenesses are a benefit to people who already have the understanding. That's really the truth. That's just something you want to search out, but that's the truth. When he spoke to them in parables, he hid it. But unfortunately, the disciples were among Jesus when he spoke to those multitudes. Remember the scripture says that when he spoke to the multitudes, he didn't speak to them except in parables. So he'd give them the parable without the understanding, and that'd be the end of the lesson. So the disciples, unfortunately, were in a sense kind of somewhat robbed there because of who, who, they, who Jesus was speaking to and who they were identified with. Be careful who you're identified with, by the way. Amen. I'll tell you, when Jesus speaks more generally, you, gotta, you wanna kind of think of who you're around, you know? Who am I around here? But when he got alone with those disciples, he gave explanations and spoke plainly. Okay? Because that, that's what they needed. They needed plain speaking so there would not be a misunderstanding of what is about to take place and the implications of that. Okay? Amen. Sister Melissa? So this shows that Jesus' sheep have an appetite. Yeah, that's right. Amen. 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 Brother Gibbon? Yes, sir. That critical night there, when it came down for him to lay his life down, he had to concentrate 100% of all of his effort in that taking, laying down his life. So what does he do? He commits his disciples to God. That's you right, know? amen. He says, I kept him now, I kept him now. And he turned it back, it's just going to be for three days. Mm-hmm. That, that's how critical the maintenance of spiritual life is. Yeah, that's right. And it's really
three week period, it could all be lost. So he right. turns them back in. Because it turns them back to the Father to keep them now, keep them. Now. So he finished. That's he right. Took them back again. Amen. That, 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 that John 17 has been provoking to me for many years. Oh, yeah. But particularly the emphasis of John 17, because he constantly is referencing the disciples. That's exactly what he said. I pray not for them. I, I mean, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Oh, that, see, that was the main thing to Jesus. These are yours. So in a sense, see, Jesus is serving just like you are. We serve the sheep in the interests of Christ because they belong to him. But Jesus served the disciples in the interests of the Father because Jesus knew better than anyone else that no man knows who the Son is but the Father. And so the Father had drawn these sheep to Jesus. And so his tender care toward them was owing to his consciousness toward God. See? That's right. Exactly. There it is. See, but that, but that was his emphasis. Now, having said this, I know that, that some people have a hard time when we, when, we really, when we really are expounding an emphasis because they think what you're saying is, well, you don't care for lost people. That's what you're saying. You don't care for lost no, it's not that there's no care for lost people because the sheep are among those. <laughs> the sheep are among those. When Paul went to Corinth, you remember Jesus encouraged him. I mean, he just got rejected at the, at the, at the synagogue, and, uh, and he turns to, a, to another house. I can't remember if it was Tyrannius or one of those. Anyways, but Jesus said, don't be afraid, Paul. I have much people in this city. The only trouble is, brethren, they hadn't yet been converted. But see, this is a high view. God knows who his sheep are. See? We don't know who they are until they're discoverable. And so I'm getting way ahead of myself. But see, brethren, this is the sense in which you preach to every creature. Preach the gospel to every creature. Because when you preach the gospel, you discover the sheep. Amen. That's how you discover the sheep. How are you going to know unless you scatter the seed everywhere? How are you going to know what kind of souls you're working with? How do you know? And so you preach the gospel to every creature, but then once the sheep are discovered, then the preferential treatment begins to come in. Amen. Now we've got some that we know are his sheep, and now we're going to focus on them. See, we're going to take the disciples away from the synagogue. And we're going to take them over to another house, and we're going to preach to them. That's the way Paul worked. That's the way he worked. Brother, Brother Jeremy. Yeah, you started to say exactly what I was sitting there thinking about this whole time. It's, like, it's one thing about going and finding sheep. It's another thing about neglecting the ones you have. That's good, yeah. yeah. This, yes. I mean, think about this. you got a shepherd who is in charge of sheep. And the shepherd says, to, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to... Once a week, for about an hour, I'm going to go spend some time with these sheep. I'll bring them maybe a bag of chips, not even really a big bag, one of those little snack bags, and I'll give that to them. It won't be long, these sheep will be dying. Yeah. And that shepherd's going to be put in jail. Yeah. Yeah. He's not taking care of the sheep. Yeah. David was a shepherd. And if you wanted to find David, 1 Samuel 17, 15 yep. says, but David, or oh, excuse me, I lost it. He, he, when he wanted to find David, he was out there taking care of the sheep. Yeah, he, yep. that, that's where they found him. Amen. Because he was a shepherd. But we have people today calling themselves shepherds, and they're neglecting the sheep. And they're dying and falling, falling by the wayside. Mm -hmm. This is wrong. And right. they're sitting them out dying. And saying, when you, your job is to bring more of them in. Mm -hmm. Well, you first got to take care of what you got. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Before you're going to um, get any more. Amen. Really good? Yes, it, it should not be necessary for us to say, no, we're not, we don't mean you don't care for the lost. Right. Mm -hmm. This is like baby talk. Yeah. Yes. Wherever there's no interest in the lost, Something is wrong. Yeah, amen, yeah. amen. And, and telling them that they ought to be, that's not what the problem is. It isn't that they don't know. Uh -huh. 
That is an idiot. That they're not alive. That's what's Amen. Amen. Because if Jesus came to seek and save the lost, he liked to put that on hold. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When it's right. feeding the sheep, the sheep, that's the ones who's going to do it. Yeah. Amen. 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 Okay, so, well, no, if, they, if they aren't doing it, then we've got a serious problem on our hands. Amen. Yes. That's right. Amen. Such a question. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of share a little testimony of this point that you were laboring about um, preaching the gospel, and that will bring the sheep out. Mm -hmm. When Brother Ricky and I went to uh, Florida, we didn't know really anything about the brethren down there. We know we knew that they needed a preacher, and and Brother Ricky was was glad to go down there. And so, uh, as our ministry continued down there, uh, Brother Ricky was faithful in preaching the gospel. And there were certain people who we thought were sheep, and yeah. others who we thought weren't sheep. Yes. But as he preached the gospel, the Lord made known who his sheep really were. Yeah. And those who were not his sheep, he made that known too. Amen. And I'll, I'll share this because I didn't share it in my introduction. Um, but Brother Gibbon was actually the one that said, if my sheep don't get fed, nobody will get fed. And that, that phrase, that sentence right there was helpful for me personally when we were in Florida to make sure that in any capacity that the Lord has given me to, to care and to help, whether it was to help encourage Brother Ricky or at a ladies' meeting or ever, the main point was to feed the Amen. flock. Amen. That's right. I just wanted to note that as far as I know about sheep, if they're healthy and strong, they naturally reproduce. That's part of their nature, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, right. yeah. Amen. 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 They don't have to be told. Now, you get in there and reproduce, okay? We're going we're to lock you up in here, and not, we want you reproducing. Right. Yeah. You to say that to men, but not to beasts. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that, actually, you could say that uh, Paul, when he was going about in, in his work and his ministry, he was actually looking that's right. For the people of God. Right. That's Amen. right. He wanted, and, you, and you can remember there was instances where he was directed to the people of God. Right. Yeah. And, Amen. And, and so, yes. you know, uh, right. and I want to say this too. Now, the Lord said, I lay down my, the good shepherd, I lays down his life for his sheep. Well, how many times did he do that? One time. Right. You yes. see. Right. So, uh, uh, this perspective that, uh, right. that what God done, he got, he done for his people. This is this is this is in the scriptures. Now. Yeah, that's right. I mean, and, and for the modern church to take this and swap it around and flip it upside down and say it's for the lost world, that is not right. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> Amen. Now, now think about this: the sheep are identifiable. Yeah. Amen. The sheep are identifiable. Okay. This is the reason why why I get upset when people emphasize bad qualities when they're speaking about likenesses between sheep and the people of God. Well, you know, the sheep, they tend to wander. The only time I could find in the scriptures where sheep were wandering is when they had no shepherd. Huh? We were, brother, we were, remember Peter recounted? We were, we were as sheep without a shepherd. But now we are returned to the chief bishop and shepherd of our souls. See, this, I looked for it because I, I, I sense something's not right about this. Something's not right about this. It, the only exception might be when Jesus talked about a, a shepherd who had a hundred sheep, but one wandered away. But brethren, that doesn't tell me that sheep are inclined to wander. That tells me sheep are inclined to stay. One percent wandered. I'm sorry, that doesn't tell me that, no, this is not the case. Because if you're going to identify the sheep, you're going to have to be able to recognize the work of God in the sheep. Okay? Not focusing on their flaws, but being able to recognize something that God has done in them. Okay? Now, did you have something, Brother Gene? I just want to mention again, isn't it in the nature of the sheep to eat? Yes, yeah. right. They're hungry. That's right. They're picky, and, too. And, and, and they move. They have to move. <laughs> right. if, they're, if they're eating grass, they have to move to find more grass. Yeah. Right. So it's just in their nature to do that. Yeah. And they'll do that as they're comfortable. They know that they're safe. They know uh -huh. that they're being watched over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so they just eat. Right. They don't yeah. have to, you know, tie them, tie them to the fence post and make them eat. 
Right. You don't have to do that. That's right. They're looking for something to eat. Amen. Amen. So if right. they're wondering, maybe they're not being fed. Yeah, that may be it. Yeah. Maybe it's just time. Brother Dave has something that I'll Oh, I'm sorry, Brother Dave. That's right. It was along that line. Sister Tosh said that sheep eat, <coughs> eats what is needful to them. Mm -hmm. They're not scavengers. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Yeah. And, yeah, they're not scavengers. And, and what I was going to say is along the same line. The point is, now, in, in this modern day of age, which it's always been to some degree, but I see it more and more now. Sheep are not the sheep are not given proper food. Mm -hmm. They're not given what they need. Mm -hmm. They're forced to eat fast food mm -hmm. or junk food. They're being forced mm -hmm. into that. And it's like Brother Gene said, their tendency is not to separate. Yeah. Right. So you have oh, yeah. so you yeah, have them trapped in right. certain areas being force fed junk that's that's actually they're gonna die from it eventually mm -hmm. if they're not yeah. out to get Amen. Someone will say now there's there's a there's a really bad sinners over here. We're gonna have to get over there. They they need they need to hear. What is the sense of which that's true? Right. But you sense of when they when the bosses went out, these went out, they're not they're not looking for the worst sinners. Yeah, no. They're looking for the sheep. Right. Yeah. 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 This is this is the sheep's only natural defense is to stay together. That's their only now. You know, they men have come up with different things like sheep dogs and and llamas and different things that they can put in with the herd or the flock. But this is the sheep's only natural defense is to stay together. It is not natural for them to be like cattle and just kind of go out on their own and graze. Yeah. They stay together. Amen. And so now we translate that into our own our own spiritual selves is. Let's say we go tomorrow, we start, the Lord tarries, and we have tomorrow and Tuesday, and maybe there's some sort of trial that we're going to enter into. Mm -hmm. Now, what is our first, what is our first thought of, Lord, just get me out of this trial? Not necessarily. It's going to be, let's get with the flock. So, hey, with so the then flock. comes Amen. Wednesday, and Amen. we gather back together, Amen. and here's our protection again. Mm -hmm. This is the protection that we have, because then, when we gather together, the shepherd's going to feed. Amen. 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 Well, scriptures tell you how to identify the sheep. You just described it. You said, My sheep, they hear my voice, they follow me, and they don't follow the voice of the heavens. Yes. 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 So it's seen in their capacity. They can hear the word. Mm -hmm. It's shown in their response. Like when the word's here, they, re they have a reaction to it, they go after it. Uh -huh. And it's shown in their consistency. They, yeah. they keep with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also, there's another section of scripture that says, We're the sheep of his pasture, which does throw the thought, Where's the pasture at? Mm -hmm. That's right. So environment plays a part too. Where are we? <laughs> yeah, amen. Here, let me give you. Oh, go ahead, brother. Really. Yeah. Can you imagine how a shepherd saying, now, "Look, we want to be more effective, so we've got a thousand sheep here. Let's split it up, and uh, and we'll have a hundred groups of ten. And uh, that, that's what that'd be. We'll have a small group. See, the flock." is protective. Yeah. Just the fact that it's a flock yeah. Yeah. is protective. Mm -hmm. And I understand that sheep in danger when they can't get away from danger, the, the weaker ones kind of end up in the right. center and they, the flock protects them. See, mm -hmm. the, the idea of flock is almost extinct in our day mm -hmm. as far as the God's people are concerned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen. I think someone in the back has something. Yeah, I was just thinking about this, and I'm just going to use my example for myself. Recently, Sister Nikki and I have had a few different trials. Mm -hmm. The kind that just makes your stomach twist and turn, and it's like, oh, yeah. man. Which, and Wednesday night, I wasn't feeling good. I just wasn't feeling good at all. I mean, I, if there was anything else going on, I would have just stayed home and slept. Yeah. But I knew I wanted to get to the meeting mm -hmm. because I had to get my head up off the this world and up on and get focused on where we're going and, and where we're heading and I knew I was going to do better. So I I went Wednesday night and I anticipated Brother Gibbon having a good study. 
and being fed. Mm -hmm. I did. Mm -hmm. And my spirit was lifted up. Yeah. I was not thinking about the things. I mean, I'm not just talking about these are the things that have to do with the world. They're going to pass away. It just bugged me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was fed. Built up, strengthened, and I, I went home with my, my thinking of things about. Now, say you turn that around. You come to a meeting where somebody is all they do is talk about the world and try to be a better person in this world. I wouldn't have helped me one bit. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have made, because things are going perfect and smooth for me in the world. Mm -hmm. I didn't need to hear about the world. Mm -hmm. I need to hear about being a, a saint and going to glory, because that's what we are. Amen. sheep are identifiable, then Jesus has said something about his sheep. And the disciples were in the hearing of this, because this was ultimately for them. Okay? So that they can see this. But that, that is what he said in John 10, 2 and 4. He said, He that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name, that kind of tells you about the kind of affinity these sheep have with him. He calls them by name and leadeth them out. I mean, you don't sense any kind of resistance at all from the sheep here. Not at all. He leads them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow them. Follow him, for they know his voice. Hey, you're hearing from the shepherd about his sheep. He's, this is the way the sheep are. Okay? We don't want to philosophize about this. Well, there are certain degrees of that, and, and let's not philosophize about it. Let's just receive what Jesus said about it. Yes. True and legitimate sheep, they hear his voice, and they follow his voice. Yes. Amen. It's critical to understand that. Amen. Okay? Go ahead, Brother Judah, and then we're, I'm going to give you some examples of this in the book of Acts. So this is good, good to consider. You just use the example of sheep. For a good reason. If he had wanted to use a dumb animal, he would have chosen a donkey or something something else. But even then, he can make the donkey talk to the man and say, hey, there's something you're not seeing up here in the pack. Mm -hmm. so that he 